Yeah, just to give an overview real quick, we do have with us today Chuck Warpahowski, who is the program director for the Michigan Collaborative to End Mass Incarceration, also known as MySEMI. Um, and what MySEMI has done, they have created a toolkit um, that will inform uh, community organizations, community activists on how to host a candidate forum in their community um, to engage these candidates, pose questions to them, and get an understanding of uh, where their interests are, what their campaign is looking like, um, and just learn more about the candidate. So that's definitely what we're here to do today is just have this uh, like a walkthrough. It's gonna be like a training almost on this toolkit and how to use it. Um, so I'll be turning it over to Chuck in a second to just go over. And I think, yeah, I think everybody's here. Um, we have the recording to use on our social media platforms just to continue to inform people around how to use this toolkit. Um, thank you all again for joining us. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you all in this space. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Chuck. Excellent, thank you so much, Danny. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, as Danny said, my name is Chuck Warpahusky with the Michigan Collaborative to End Mass Incarceration. And as we get settled in, I'd just like to hear from a few of you if we could do just a couple of quick introductions. We don't have to get to any to everybody, but what I would love to hear is a couple of people introduce themselves with their name, their organization, and when you are deciding who to vote for, right? We are, this is a committed group of voter advocates. And when you're making your choices who to vote for, especially down ballot, like city council, judge, primaries, how do you make your choices on who to vote for? You can either raise your hand or just come off mute and say it, or if you'd rather, you can put it in the chat. Who wants to go first? Um, hold on. You said do it in the chat. Let me see. Or you can come off mute, Marcus. Go ahead. Just one sentence of your name, your organization, and one sentence about how you choose who to vote for. Um, my name is Marcus Kelly of Pathway for Success. And when I vote, I um I see if our I see if our um our agendas line up. So you're looking for that agenda, that alignment on the issues you care about. Beautiful. Who else wants to share? I can go, Chuck. Oh, Jenny. I, I often rely on the Plymouth Dems to um, give me who they are considering. And so I'm looking at other resources often to find out what they're recommending. So you're looking at an organization in that case to help you find some selection. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. And you know the one you're going to. Back to Marcus's point about alignment, you know the one you turn to to get that sense of alignment. Mm -hmm. So for folks who have just joined, we're giving a couple introductions, not going to get through everybody, but your name, if there's an organization you're representing, and when you are deciding who to vote for, oh, it helps you make that decision. Ranine? Hello, my name is Ranine. Um, I'm not from an organization right now, but I'm here from um, U of M Dearborn for a class um, project. But when I'm deciding who to vote for, I look for someone who's... Um, ready to start something for like the future generations or has good ideas for what's going to happen in the future. So you're looking for, look, look not just now, but you're looking at, at the future and who's got that vision of the future and including those future generations and the policies of today. Thank you, Renee. Marianne wrote in the chat that she votes based on their stances on issues. Let's hear from one or two more. My name is Maria. I'm also from U of M Dearborn. Um, when I vote for candidates, I usually look for people who are already involved in their community and who've already made an impact. You wanna see that track record, beautiful. Thank you, Maria. Katie is sharing that she researches their stances on criminal justice reform issues and then looks at how innovative and open to change they are. Beautiful. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get into the training because all of this one, ah, and then you always bump, people bump around, right? Once I do this. So um, 
Danny, I'm going to need you to call on people if they're raising their hand. I can't see faces right now as I'm sharing my screen. But um, why this, before we get into what we're looking at in terms of voter education around these issues, a lot of you talked about uh, caring about the issues and wanting to make sure candidates are aligned. Within Michigan Collaborative 10 Mass Incarceration, our role is to help the organizations, those frontline organizations like Ginny mentioned, collaborate together better on issues like police accountability, sentencing reform, conditions in prison, and reentry services to help change the narrative around mass incarceration in Michigan, and to make sure that the resources uh, that are saved from reducing our prison population, that those resources go back into the communities that have been most harmed uh, by these systems and policies of mass incarceration. And as you know, as voter voting advocates, that voter engagement is super important. And we're going to go over some tools that we've developed at my semi to help support this work that uh, intersects really well with the work that VAC is already doing. Um, and so the resources we'll be covering is one, we've created a voter engagement toolkit that gives you a lot of how to and guidance around making sure voters have the information they need to make those decisions you're talking about. It's one thing to say we want alignment. How do you find out if there really is that alignment there? So the Voter Engagement Toolkit is one of the resources we have for you. We are offering mini grants for organizations that want to do voter um, candidate forums, voter toolkits, and other kinds of ways to make sure voters are engaged and informed about these issues. Um, and the deadline for that is coming up pretty soon. It's in 10 days on the 27th, so you can follow through on the link there. And we also offer technical assistance. Funders love to use tech fancy phrases like technical assistance. It just means we're here to help. So if you've got a question about how to organize a candidate forum or how to do a toolkit or any of these things, drop me an email, get in touch, we're here to help. And within this, when we think about making sure that voters who care about our issues and who have been, especially those who have been harmed by mass incarceration, either through police contact, uh, incarceration, whatever, or family and friends who have been involved as well, what does it take to make sure that they are able to make sure that their values, their experiences are part of the election dis discussion? A lot of the work that VAC is doing right now is making sure that they are ready to vote, that they know that they are eligible, that they are registered to vote, that they're motivated. You know, with the jail voting work you do, if they are in jail held pretrial, that they have access to, to voting. It's their right, but they don't always have access. So this is a key part. Without this, nothing else uh, happens. Another piece of the work that VAC does is get out the vote work. Right. As you're doing your events, you're getting those voter pledge cards to make sure that you know who is who's saying they want to vote so you can help make sure they remember to come out uh, for that August or November election. So that's a key part to move that intention to vote into the actual action. But what we're here, we're here to talk about is that middle piece, helping make sure that the voters are informed about the issues and the candidates. When I asked you, how do you choose who to vote for? You said you're looking for, many of you said, you wanna make sure that they are in line with the issues you care about, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's a vision for the future, you wanna know if they've made an impact in their community already. And sometimes there's a lot of advertisement. If we're talking about the governor's race, if we're talking about the presidential race, we're getting information and opinions about that on our social media, in our mailbox, on our doorstep. We get a lot of information, not always from trusted sources, but there's a lot of information available. But if we're talking about some of these down ballot races, right, like a judge, maybe a, a city council member or a township board of supervisors, sometimes it can be less possible, less available to know well, how do they stand on Michigan's out of control sentence lengths? What do they think should be done to support people coming home from prison to make sure they're set up to succeed? So the, this toolkit and these resources we're offering you 
we'll give you some ways to help create that third piece so that the voters who care about these issues who have been harmed by mass incarceration can vote and can have an informed vote that helps make sure that they're the choices they're making in the ballot box are in line with their values. For me, we're talking a lot about voter education, but I see this as a two-way process. For background, for me, a little bit of background for me, I spent uh, over 20 years in nonprofit community organizing. I've organized candidate forums. I've organized uh, voter guides, but I've also been on the other side of it. I've been in local elected office, and so I've filled out a lot of these. I've been in a lot of the church basements or or community rooms to have the to be on these voter engagement uh, pieces as a candidate. And I'll tell you, this education piece works both ways. Yes, we want to let voters know what their what the issues are, help them understand where the candidates stand. And we also want to help the candidates know what the issues are. We want a lot of candidates, they are covering a lot of issues in their office. And they're hearing maybe about potholes, maybe they're hearing about traffic. Um, we wanna make sure that they are hearing about the issues you care about, issues related to uh, the criminal legal system and mass incarceration, that they're getting good information about it, not just the, the sensationalist news headlines. And especially we want them to learn that there are people in their district who care about these issues. So it's not just um, Lansing-based interest groups. If you're in Lansing-based, uh, if you're a Lansing or nonprofit or person that not to throw that out, but like we want to know this is this is local for them, right? Any questions on that? Yeah, I, I can't see the the hand. So, Danny, are we seeing anything? Anybody uh, raising their hand? I don't see anyone's hands up right now. All right, I'm either so clear that everybody's with me, or so opaque that nobody's following along. So, I'll just believe it's clear. I see your thumbs up. When, thumbs uh, up. All right. Hey, okay. Mar Marcus, Marcus has his hand up now. Go for it, Marcus. Uh, can y'all hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was one. It was, I wrote a note down so uh, that I didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, you know, I never really, uh, it, it never really dawned on me that people that's waiting in jails, that's a waiting free trial or or something like that, can still vote. They still have they, they still they can still allowed to vote. So that's um, wow. And I'll just make sure I heard that right. <laughs> yes, sir. That's absolutely correct. So, so my question in that aspect is um, the, the thing about how hostile um, the the jails are, uh, especially when it comes to voting. How do you how are you able to go in there and educate the um, the inmates uh, that they allowed to vote still? Do they have that right and and, and you know and register them if they're not registered? That's that's why you got to come to our weekly meetings. <laughs> You've been involved with this work. We got people going into county jails, registering them to vote, collecting ballots. So just stick around, bro. You'll find oh, man, that's that beautiful. Need to know. That's beautiful. Okay, I, I, that's you, you just you just schooled me. So I didn't even know. <laughs> so you you came to the right place. You came to the right place. Yes. So in, in addition to folks not knowing this piece around jail voting. I didn't know about it until a year or two ago either. Another people, another thing that often trips people up, especially for those of you, some of you aren't connected to a nonprofit, but some of you are. And when you start talking about voter education, there will always be somebody, and maybe it's been you, maybe it's a board member or a donor who says, whoa, 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 we're a nonprofit or we're a church. We can't get political. So part of what this toolkit and this training is helping you to do, and thanks, Jenny, for putting the jail voting webpage into the chat um, for Marcus and others. But part of what this toolkit is, is here to help you to do is to understand what the rules are for nonprofits. Because you can do a lot to make sure that voters make informed decisions when they go to vote. But there's some things you can't do. As a nonprofit, you cannot support or oppose candidates for public office. 
you can't say, hey, um, Marcus is our guy. Everybody come vote for Marcus. Can't do that. You can't go say, hey, Chuck, he's, he's pretty sketchy. Stay away from Chuck. You can't oppose candidates for public office. Um, but there's a lot you can do. You can support or oppose a ballot initiative, right? So there's a ballot initiative around ending predatory lending. And people with criminal backgrounds are specifically targeted by lenders who are doing these predatory lending tactics. You can support or oppose that ballot initiative to end predatory lending. Um, you can engage in nonpartisan election efforts. And we'll talk through about what some of those, what that looks like. So to help people understand the voting process, right, to that point around jail voting, how do you get a ballot? How do you turn it in if you are held in jail pretrial? Uh, you can help them understand, here's where the candidates stand, as long as you're not from that saying, here's who to vote for, right? You can do that through candidate forms and voter guides, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And you can help them understand some of the key issues, right? That Michigan is spending so much money on prisons uh, that are harming our community by keeping families apart and taking money that could be spent on mental health or job training and things like that in community. You can talk about these issues that are important in the election. Uh, some of these, there's other rules, like if you're doing with supporting or opposing a ballot initiative that's called lobbying, there's limits on it. Most nonprofits aren't anywhere close to their limits, but we'll give you some resources to help learn more about that in a, in a little bit. Um, we said you can involve, be involved in nonpartisan voter education. One way to make sure that you're staying legal there is to cover a broad way, range of issues. Unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, you can pay, take your pick. The IRS has not given clear guidance on what constitutes a broad range of issues. So, you know, within the issue, within the topic of mass incarceration, that includes police accountability, right? As we said at the top, that includes sentencing, that includes access to training and conditions for people who are incarcerated, that includes reentry services, that includes things like um, removing barriers to employment, like housing discrimination and, and things like that. So whether or not that counts as a broad range of issues is a little bit uncertain. Um, but one thing you can do is you can build partnerships with other groups, other nonprofits, so that you're covering, you're, you're making sure you're covering a wide range of issues. Another thing to make sure as you're doing these pieces is to make sure that you are giving uh, all the candidates an equal chance to respond, right? So if Kathy Harris and uh, Bonnie are in and are running against each other, you can't say, hey, Kathy, fill out this candidate questionnaire and not ask Bonnie. You've got to give them an equal chance to respond. If it's a candidate form, you've got to give them equal time. Another piece, and this gets, this gets a little bit, you've got to be careful with this one, is you can ask them for their stance on issues, but you can't ask them to make a pledge or a commitment. So for example, you could ask, and in our candidate, in our toolkit, we have a lot of sample questions on various issues that we've worked with nonprofits and advocates across the state to develop. But you could ask somebody, hey, you know, Michigan has some of the longest sentences in the country and they are, they're so long, they're, they stop keeping us safe, they just waste money. What do you think the state should do about it? That's an okay question to ask. You can't say, if elected, will you promise to support good time? That's then you're trying that's too close to electioneering where you'd indicate who to support or oppose. Uh, and then in do if you're doing in a candidate forum or events, um, you, your moderator has to stay neutral. So back to Kathy and Bonnie, if Bonnie gives an answer. And the moderator says, wow, great answer. And then, um, then the other candidate says something is like, ooh, I don't know about that. If the moderator is showing favoritism, that's a, that's a no-go. You've got to stay neutral in terms of the candidates, but make sure that the voters have the information to make their own choices about who to support. 
Uh, there are a lot of other resources on about this. There's a national organization called Boulder Advocacy that is fantastic about helping make sure that people understand the tools so that they can be as impactful as possible as a nonprofit in an election season. Uh, Nomi is asking, can, can it be a pledge on something more general, like uh, a pledge to work on criminal justice reform? So two, dis excuse me, two disclaimers to, in response. First of all, I'm not an attorney. So you sometimes people say don't 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 try this without a net. So you might want to get additional guidance on that on that. Um, the second piece with that is the standard uh, what an what attorneys will usually tell you is it depends. And so remember that the the fundamental goal, the fundamental rule is you can't support or oppose a candidate for public office. So if you are asking, and this is this is a, a couple nuances here, hopefully I don't get too far into the weeds. You can sit down as a as a constituent or your board can sit down one on one with a candidate and ask them for that commitment. Um, but in a public forum, like a, a questionnaire or a candidate forum, if you ask them to make that commitment and one said yes and one said no, the question for that the IRS would ask is, is this creating a situation where you are endorsing or opposing a candidate for public office? So I think a, a broad question that says, like, what will you do to address the injustices in our criminal legal system. So it's still pointed, right? We're still trying to make sure they're dealing with, and it can even be more, spe more specific. What are you gonna do to address the racial disparities in our criminal legal system? That gives them a lot of room to, to cover it how they will, but it's not so narrow that it then leads like, makes it read like you're supporting or opposing a specific candidate. Um, Nomi also asked in the chat, does the candidate form have to be on a wide range of issues? Could you have a candidate form that is advertised on being a specific topic like um, healthcare? So again, this is where the, the IRS has, so two things. One, this is where the IRS has not been very focused on what create, what represents a broad range of issues. And I think you could argue it different ways. And again, they're going to be looking at, does this create an event that supports or opposes a candidate uh, a, um, opposes a candidate for public office? So if you know one candidate is a public health nurse and she's got a really good record on health care and the other candidate has been missing in action on the issue and it's like, okay, this is really set up to make one candidate look good, that is going to create more questions. That said, IRS enforcement on these issues has been infrequent. If they were finding a lot of, or if they were citing a lot of nonprofits over violations on this, we have the case law to say, okay, this is what they're giving the green light. This is what they're giving the red light. So I would say within that, again, consult an attorney if you're concerned. And two, look for ways to make sure you're covering a broad aim, broad range of issues within healthcare. Maybe you talk about prenatal health care. Maybe you talk about public health. Maybe you try to make sure you're covering a broad issue, a, a range. I certainly, as a candidate, went to nonprofit hosted candidate forums on things as narrow as affordable housing. So it happens, nobody got in trouble, but the more narrow, the more you've got to be careful to make sure you're you're avoiding supporting or opposing a candidate for public office. Great questions. Any other questions at this point? I don't see any other hands going up. Chuck. All right. If anything else comes up, raise that hand or I'll put it in the chat. So this is the this is the premise. You want to make sure that voters know about the issues that are important in the election 
know where the candidates stand, and they can make their they can make an informed choice when they're casting that 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 ballot. Uh, at this top of the presentation, I listed four key strategies or tactics that you can use. Candidate forums, right, where you ask candidates to respond to a question in like live, like they're on a stage or they're in a Zoom room. A voter guide where you, you're asking them the questions, but instead of it being live on stage, they're writing up their responses and then you're publishing. Those are the public sides of it. You can also just have individual meetings with candidates or staffers. Hey, I really care about this. Here's my story. Here's my daughter's story. I want to make sure you, well, where do you stand on this? And then the fourth option is you can engage them on the campaign trail. Sometimes this is called bird dogging, where you follow them around, or you get a group of people to follow them around. And every time they're doing a coffee hour or something, you get somebody, ideally a different person, to be like, hey, what about mass incarceration? What about this issue? What about that issue? So that they're saying, like, wow, everywhere I go, people are asking me about this. The attendees hear about the issue, and the candidates hear about the issue as well. We've got a lot. On the one hand, we've got a lot of information about these, but, the, but I've got a secret to tell you about them. It's not actually all that complicated, right? It's like, here's somebody who wants to earn your vote, ask them a question. Make sure you got enough people who are on board with you so that they, they've got to, they know they've got to pay attention, and then make sure that other people in the community know how they answer. Yes, it, it can, depending on how big you want to go, it can be a lot of work, it can be a little work, but it's not really that complicated. You can all do this, and I encourage you all to do this. Um, so be before I go on to some tips and tricks, and we, again, we've got a lot in the in the voter toolkit on these. Does anybody have either a question about any of these main tactics or an example of when you've seen them used effectively? Marcus, I see you and I, we'll get to you, but I want to make sure other folks who have, who have a thought get a chance to chime in too, okay? Anybody else? All right, Marcus, the floor is, the floor is yours. You're muted. You got to take yourself off mute, Marcus. Okay, can you hear me? Got you now. Okay, as far as tactics, um, like when say say if, uh, if 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 I'm following the candidate around to make sure uh, I, I keep drilling it in as far as uh, his position on his or her position on uh, reform or something like that. Um, if they if they if they have a if they are having a speaking event, say uh, up north four or five hours away, and I decided I want to go to that speaker event to make sure I, I continue asking that question, um, is is there like a stipend uh, to reimburse gas if I decide if I've done that or no? If you if you do work with that, yeah, they would be given a stipend. But okay, no. You gotta get involved, and, and that can definitely be provided. Okay, that's 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 one one question I asked, and the next one is, um, I have I usually write my questions down. Okay, that's 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 all I can think of right now is a re gas reimbursement for those kind of things because that's that's something that, that I actually do. So, <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna suggest that you hang on after, maybe after the call or get in touch with one of the other back um organizers so they can give you the full rundown because there's a lot of amazing things that back is doing in terms of the voter engagement at all the stages including uh things that can be compensated for so uh make sure you have that one-on-one -on -one to figure out how to plug in best all right thank you but you but that example of engaging on the campaign trail i love that you brought it up because it can be that simple hey this candidate is having a a uh, potluck or a candidate forum or a coffee hour. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna ask them maybe one on one, maybe if there's a Q and A about this issue, and I'm gonna try to make sure that they've got to stake out their position. And you said maybe I should roll head up four or five hours, 
the one of the pieces of this is if you're doing this with, with the same candidate, it's like, oh, here comes Marcus, here comes Chuck, and they know it's just you. They know it's just you. Know, that when again, when I was in public office, I knew there were a couple people. I knew who they were. They were always going to say the same things. But the groups have said, you know what? I know that I've got four friends who all have the same thing, and so um, I'm going to head up do this thing on Tuesday and she's going to do the thing on Saturday and he's going to do the thing on Thursday. So I was seeing different faces. That's an even better way to play that. It doesn't need a lot of people. It doesn't need, again, it's not complicated. Just know your question. If you've got a personal story, if you've got a fact and maybe, okay, she's going to talk about what happened to her cousin and he's going to cite this new research paper that dropped out and somebody's going to talk about a news article the other day. So they're, they're, saying the same thing but with different words and it feels like it's a real organic concern in the community it's going to come off all that much stronger for the candidates and it's going to help influence it's going to help influence how they think about it if they get in office and it's going to be a way to have a good look for the other people who are showing up too so thanks for giving that example of of showing up at a candidate event has anybody had an experience either attending or organizing a candidate forum that they'd like to talk about? I know some of you on this call have been there. I can say something. Um, my name's Isra. Thank you. I came in a little bit late, but so far, I uh, appreciate your, your training and, and your delivery. Um, I did one one time with my organization uh, that I formerly used to work with, and I think the thing that is very important is to make sure that you're authentically like reaching out to all the candidates that are running, because I know that you can fall into some issues with that, you know, um, or say, yeah, we did invite everybody, but like you kind of half ass the ones that you didn't really want there. Um, so just making sure that it's, yeah, that that's deliberate and, and it's just good for everybody to be able to hear for their, for themselves that these candidates maybe don't stand on where they, they want them to stand. Um, so yeah, just wanted to flag that. Thanks. Thank you. So you learned to be really intentional about making sure that all the candidates knew about it and had a, an invitation. Was there anything else you learned as you were doing your candidate forums, Isra? Um, it's a lot of bureaucracy and it takes a long time to get to these candidates, especially depending on which you know level of candidacy they are. If it's local, it's a little bit easier, but um, congressional folks are a lot harder um, yeah. to get hold of and you have to have relationships and that takes years and so on and so forth. So kind of leaning on like fellow staff that maybe had that relationship with some of the, um, some of those folks and their staff was helpful to get some answers. So it's not always a one person job to coordinating these things. You have to lean on everybody. Yeah. And a hundred percent of the more local, the race, the easier it will be. And part of that's based on relationships and part of it's based on how many demands there are on a candidate's time. You know, during campaign season, they're raising money, they're knocking on doors, they're do, they're organizing, they're, they're prepping for debates. Some of them have day jobs while they're doing it all. They're, they're pretty busy. And so when they're deciding, am I gonna show up at this candidate forum? Am I gonna show up at this house party? Am I gonna take the time to fill out this, this candidate questionnaire? They gotta decide, is it worth my time? And one way you lifted up the role of relationships. Oh, I, I see. Booker's behind it. I know Booker's going to get the word out. And so I better fill up this because because I, I don't want Booker telling me I'm not responsive, telling people I'm not responsive. So those relationships can be important. And then the other way is to know like, oh, there's the, whether it's the organizations or something else to say, this is going to have reach. It's not just five people who are going to read this. It's not going to just 10 people are going to be on the Zoom. A lot of people are going to be here about this. So if I blow it off, that's going to look bad for on me as a candidate. Making sure you know you, the candidates know you've got the numbers behind them is another way to get uh, participation. So thank you for that, Isra. And so you you also looked it up in the chat that the voter guide was you had a good response rate with the voter guide as well. So thank you for putting that in the chat. Booker, you're about to say something. Looked like. Yeah, I was uh, just going to say, yes, it's very important unless you have you like a 401c3 uh, or, or a super PAC where you can actually fight uh, politically, which we are able with Michigan liberation. But 
when it comes to doing the work with that. So I'm glad that we are able to, because we're able to endorse and we're able to, uh, but we also always invite all of the candidates. You wanna make sure that it's clear that you, you know, that's, you can't put a greater emphasis on, on not showing, you know, that you're not doing things in decent and in order by inviting everyone because hey, quite honestly, you might have someone that you have really leaned on uh, voting for. And then when you invite everyone that you find that, hey, this person is more authentic. This person is more aligned with my ideas. So you don't want to close, be closed-minded going in somewhere thinking, hey, because this candidate is from the hood or come, this candidate is from there, did that mean that they got your best interest in in behalf so the, you know they'll white boozle us and they'll black boozle us so we just have to keep in mind that we have to be critical thinkers amen to that and so the that it's beneficial for you for us to have a, a fair forum where we can really learn where the candidates stand and it's also important for the candidates right if i get this invitation you know if katie sends me an invitation like oh i know I'm going to show up and they're just going to rip me a new one. I'm going to stay away. I know it's not, if I if I think I'm not going to get fair treatment as a candidate, why waste my time? So that that fairness, that commitment to being a, a neutral party, as in Booker raised that there's some not, the rules I said for nonprofits apply to what are called 501c3 nonprofits. There's different rules for what are 501c4 nonprofits like Michigan Liberation. Um, so. I didn't want to get you into all the tax code, but there are, there's variation. Um, but if you're doing that kind of neutral candidate forum piece to let the voters decide, setting a fair, uh, neutral platform is going to be important so that you can learn what you need to learn, the participants learn what they need to learn, and that the candidates walk in knowing that they're going to get a fair hearing and it's worth their time. Booker, go ahead. Not only that, when you are uh, campaigning for, you know, you want uh, you want everybody to be on the same page and everything. When you when you when you're reaching out to people, and uh, you're accountable first. Accountability starts with yourself. That's basically all I'm saying. And if we expect these candidates to be accountable, then we have to be accountable and in line doing the same thing that we are, you know voicing that we want them to do. Beautiful, thank you for that word. I also wanna lift up, I missed this when I first read Isra's chat about reputation. She said like LWV, League of Women Voters. And Kathy, I see your hand up next. Another resource for this, like I, we talked about having the people behind you, you don't have to do this all on your own, right? Maybe there's a group like the League of Women Voters that's already trying to get people informed. Maybe there's a group, maybe there's a group of parents who are worried about education or a PTO that's doing a candidate forum on the school board elections and you and you can show up and be like, hey, I'm really concerned about police and schools. They didn't help at all in Uvalde, but kids are getting arrested for just doing stuff that I got got away with when I was a kid. Can we can we put that in your candidate forum and we'll help get people there? You don't have to do this all on your own. Build some of those partnerships. You get that reputation and you get more people to help share the, share the work. Kathy. I just wanted to add, um, okay, I got to turn something off here. Uh -oh. Sorry. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. okay. Is that better? No. Right. There we go. I'm going to keep okay. I'd be afraid I'm going to cut everybody off on the call. So good afternoon. But I wanted to, um, when you were talking about the candidates forum and you asked if anyone had done this before, mm -hmm. well, I've done both. Um, but the last one that I did was a questionnaire and we mm -hmm. sent, I asked some un uncomfortable questions, but I made sure that I sent those uncomfortable questions to all of the candidates at the same time so that they wouldn't say, well, I got mine and I didn't get, the other person didn't get theirs, whatever. I sent the mm -hmm. email, I sent an email out at the same time. But I found that with doing that, those that didn't want to respond, they just didn't answer. So mm -hmm. I went an extra step to call them to just to make sure they got the information and gave them the opportunity to submit their answers. I gave them another day. 
to submit their answers and they decided they didn't want to answer anyway. So I said, as long as you understand that I'm going to, I'm going to publish this as is. And I did that. Um, mm -hmm. They tried to give me some kickback, but I, there was nothing I could do about it. I sent everybody the same and I was able to explain that, um, that I asked questions. And it was, it was a race, there were several race related questions they felt they didn't want to answer. So I'm just saying that to say that if you do the questionnaire, just as you stated earlier, just make sure that you send it out to every candidate. And it's good to send it out at the same time so that you got proof to send it out at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then there's nothing they can say. Our organization, our president for our eighth floor Randolph always says that we are nonpartisan, but we are particular. So mm -hmm. those issues that affect our community are the issues that we want you to, to we want to question. We have no problem with doing that, but we make sure we ask everybody those qu same questions. Absolutely. And I, I love that it was, you made sure you, there were two layers, right? First was the initial send out. It was all at the same time. Nobody could question that. And then the folks who didn't respond, you didn't give them that out to say, oh, I didn't see the email. You, you followed up with a personal phone call to make sure everybody had that chance. And if they're choosing not to participate, that's on them. And, and that's okay, right? You can do this and not at not like the um, Detroit Regional Chamber at the Mackinac Conference. Some of the candidates for Republican candidates for governor decided they didn't wanna go. That's on them. Didn't mean they had to shut down the, the forum but everybody, all of the candidates had that option, right? So great example, Kathy, thank you. A couple of pieces to think about as you do this together. Framing the issues is very important, right? Especially around these issues around the criminal legal system, especially now when the press is banging that drum about violent crime rates. How you talk about these issues it is, is important. So prep yourself once if you've got the stories or the facts that help um, set up the kinds of answers you're looking for. Not just what do you think about um, prison rates, but you know we've got elderly people in our prison who aren't a risk to society. It's costing us millions of dollars to give them medical care inside when we could be saving money. They could be spending their last days with their family. Um, it would save the taxpayers, it would give them a death with dignity. Um, what about helping address this problem? You can set that up. And then they could say, I think it's dangerous. You could, they could say whatever. But you can set up the question to try to get the answer that moves us in the direction. Stories are great for that. Facts are great for that. And again, in the toolkit, we've got some resources for that. But this is also a chance for you to customize one with your own. It's a chance for you to bring in what brings you to this issue personally. And it's a chance to customize to your community. Is there somebody from your city or town that's been touched where you can say, this is, this is why it matters here? Because a story that Kathy can say in Grand Rapids may be, and we know some of the stories Kathy can talk about in Grand Rapids, especially related to policing. But those might be different stories than somebody's gonna, than Audrey's gonna talk about in Ypsilanti. And that's fine. That local connection, building those personal connections is, a, is part of the framing. And again, we've got a lot of sample questions that you in the toolkit that you can start with and then find those, per, those local connections too. So this is, fits in with that second point of customize this to your community, right? A way to talk about the issue in East Lansing might not work in Escanaba or vice versa. Um, so find, you know, this is part of why it's good to have that local connection. Um, excuse me, I've got a spider coming down my screen. Um, <laughs> uh, that Find that local connection and that local team to work with so you can come together to find that, those stories and framing that work for your community. We've talked about this already. But the stronger your audience, the stronger your candidate engagement is going to be. So if you've got people know, like, like Kathy knew, hey, through the A. Philip Randolph Institute, we're going to make sure people see your answers or not answers. Like that matters versus me just saying, hey, I got a couple of questions for you. Can you fill this up? Right? The stronger your audience, the stronger your response. And we, we touched on this a little bit already, but um, candidates are busy, 
So think through how to be mindful of your time, how to make, make it easy for them to say yes to showing up at your candidate forum or to fill out your candidate questionnaire. I remember I, when I was running for office one year, I got a 20 question survey from a local organization on a lot of issues that had nothing to do with local government, each of which wanted a two, basically would have taken a two or three page response. They wanted a, a theme, uh, would, you know, like your semester final project as the candidate forum for a small organization. Like I haven't got time for this. Like I care about you, I care about your issues, I care about your values, but I can't do this. Um, so think through, how do you make sure you're making it easy for them to say yes, so that they are able to, to communicate, this is where I stand. And then it's also important for your readers or your attendees, right? Everybody's got time constraints. It's gonna make it easier for them to plug in as well. So, We've talked about why it's important to do this kind of issue education to educate both the voters and the candidates. We've talked about some of the tactics that we can use to do so. We've talked about some strategies and we've talked about staying, um, keeping on the right side of the law if you're a 501c3 nonprofit. You know, a consistent theme has been to, to build power with by working with others. And so I'm curious, and I'm gonna stop share here for a moment. As you think about, if you were to do candidate uh, and voter education, are there some groups or people who you think of who would be great partners for you in doing this work? You can come off mute and share them online out loud, or you can put them in the chat. Yeah, Chuck, okay. I'll just say this here. When it comes to uh, a aligning yourself and your organization, church, or whoever that you are with. And when it comes to voting resources, voting ideas, um, you definitely want to vet the people that you deal with and everything carefully uh, through cognitive thought. And that, uh, because, you know, it's so much, uh, so much corruption, I guess, what, what I would say that comes and tries to infiltrate, especially when you're dealing with people who can actually endorse candidates and everything, but they'll get in the midst of things and you will never, and it'll sound so good. We had someone, put, uh, for an example, come from all the way from out of town on a meeting when we were doing some stuff uh, with candidates and, and I'm telling you, it was just like the perfect, it was just too perfect with this lady. And our director, she flagged it right away. She said, you know, when it comes to something like that, sometimes if it's too good to be true, sometimes, sometimes it's too good to be true. It may be something that you want to keep your eyes on. You look at the resurrections in Minnesota and the people that were coming from out of town who were coming, engaging in the violence and everything. And you having it look like it was someone else. But yeah, definitely. It's the old syndrome, cowboys and Indians. The cowboys dress up like the Indians and go in and tear up a town and then who gets blamed? Right. So yeah, make sure that you've got, when you're building this team, it's people who you trust, who have aligned um, important point. Thank you, Booker. We heard earlier from, from Easter that League of Women Voters was a key ally in her voter engagement. What are some other people or organizations you might work with to do this? In the organization, so Charles, NAACP, NAACP chapters across the state, absolutely. And um, I, I also throw in the um, the Divine Nine, uh, which are the um, African American uh, fraternity and sororities. They're they're doing um, a lot of work and doing a lot of planning in that area as well. This, this might be a um, like more administrative side, but I think leaning on and working with libraries, for example, or places that actually can host these things in a neutral setting too, because sometimes space is an issue. So just building relationships with those types of entities. Yep, libraries, community centers, somebody mentioned churches, a lot of these end up being in church basements. So absolutely.
you know, Charles, when you were mentioning the um, divine nine, it also reminded me there's often groups like there's various sometimes ethnic chambers of Congress or people of color chamber, black chambers of commerce, groups like that that might be able to bring in or just your straight up business groups that might be able to bring in a line to say like, hey, we're struggling to hire people. If we're pe keeping people in prison too long, not giving them training in prison and then not supporting them when they come home, that undermines my ability to to keep the restaurant operating or to or if you're keeping somebody in jail pre-trial before they've been convicted and I can't they're not showing up on my shift and they're not dangerous that's hurting not just them it's hurting me so by looking for some of those uh, non-traditional allies either as an organization or just a speaker is good uh, Marcus oh um one of the one of the tactics um that I, that I use down here in Las Vegas with Make It Work Nevada is I would actually go out in the community and um, I would have people sign, um, you know, waivers, you know, so I can, in case I had to use their responses on TV or something like that. But I would ask them during the, during, during the midterms, I was asking them like who, um, you know, what, what, what kind of kitchen table conversations are you and your family having? What, what keeps you up at night uh that makes you know what I'm saying that you think needs to be addressed is not being addressed and like so I say if a person was running for district attorney I would ask them do you know what a district attorney does and do you think he represents you and and things like that and I would have them respond to it and then when we actually ask all the candidates that's running for it we kind of play the uh play what the community was saying to them before we pose our question so you use that community voice as a way to set up the question so folks knew it was grounded by people's kitchen table concerns. Thank Correct. you for that, Marcus. I see Charles's hands up, and then we'll, there's somebody else in shared they can share, and then we're going to wrap things up. Charles. Uh, yeah, I say that when you collaborate with these other organizations, it also gives you an opportunity to expand or broaden the base of your questions so you don't get um, dropped into that hole of you know, not being too narrowly focused. So, I mean, you can exchange these questions and really come out with something that um, might work out in every form for everybody and everybody that comes before somebody, they wind up getting your questions and you wind up getting theirs. The other organizations is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then everybody's stronger and everybody's more protected that way. Absolutely. Thank you, Charles. Booker, I see your hand up, but I, but I want to make sure that if somebody hasn't shared out, they, if you've got a question or a comment, I want to make sure we get room for everybody. All right, Booker, everybody wants to hear what you have to say. You get the last word, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, and I'll be short on it. Uh, you know, when you're building your power and you're building uh, with your partners, you know, you can go to homeless shelters, you know, go to places where people are most impacted by the current system. The ones who are impacted the most in a negative way are the ones that you want to educate so that you can build some of that power and let those people know that their votes count and everything because a lot of them just don't. Absolutely. So what I'm part of what I'm hearing is go to them. Don't just assume they're going to come to you. Meet, you got to meet the people where they are. Some people can't get around. They can't mm -hmm. travel. Some of the situations that's going on with transportation mm -hmm. in communities. Yeah. And their their interest, their voice, their vote matters. So absolutely make that extra step so that they're included too. Beautiful. Thank you. Good and good closing word, Booker. We did hear some additional resources in the chat. Laura's inviting everybody to come on over to UM Dearborn. Nomi shared M Gage. Nomi, can you just tell us what that is, please? Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly what it stands for, but it's a it's a Muslim group that, but they they don't only promote Muslim candidates. They do a lot of education. I can't I can't okay. remember. What it, I'll we'll look, we'll it we'll look it up. We'll if you find it, drop the link in the chat. Uh, and then we had um, Carolyn talking about Bar Association, League of Women Voters. She gave a couple of groups that have been local in Washtenaw County. 
So lots of groups. And we just want to make the moment for you to think about this so that you know you're not alone in this. You can build a team. Like I said earlier, this is not that complicated and it can be extremely, extremely powerful. So just to wrap up, what I encourage you all to do is to go online, download that toolkit. We covered a lot of it here, but it gives you a some additional great resources. Again, on that same link is the application if you want to apply for a mini grant to do some of this work in a community across Michigan. Um, it's got to be 501c3. It's uh, organization or fiscally sponsored, and you have to be a my semi member. But membership is free. We just need to know that you're on our team. Back to Booker's word about uh, building trust. So find some friends, apply for that mini grant and make a difference. As Booker was saying, everybody's voice and vote matters, but they're not all getting included. You can be powerful voices to make sure that we close that gap and include everybody in the elections and the policies that shape our communities. So that's what I got for you. Thank you all. It has been fun. I loved your comments. Danny, anything else before we wrap up? Um, just a huge shout out to you, Chuck, for that presentation. Thank you very much to you and the Michigan Collaborative the MAS Incarceration for your hard work and efforts around voting rights. Um, definitely want to thank everybody for taking the time out to join us for today's training. And I want to remind you all that this is not our typical meeting. This was a special training that we had in place for today. So I would like to welcome everybody who just joined us for the first time today back to join us again next week because it's our practice that we just like for everybody to introduce themselves when they join us, the organization that they may be with um, in order for us to just welcome you into this space and bring you into our VAC family. So I definitely want you all to come back next week, 1230 to 1.30, um, so we can just have our formal introductions. Definitely want to inform everybody that we have a lot of Juneteenth events going on this weekend. If you all want to get out and do some voter outreach, do some engagement with the community, we have a link to a spreadsheet that gives details about the locations, the times that these events will be happening. So please tap in with the spreadsheet if you want to join us to do some voter outreach and community outreach and some further uh, engagement dates as well. Also, we'd like to inform everybody that there is a conversation going on right now on Zoom between uh, the millennials and, I'm trying to remember what it was called again, uh, the millennials and the youth voting. This is a conversation happening with uh, Michigan United. Um, VAC is a sponsor of this. Grand Rap is proactive, but it's a conversation going on right now. Kathy, if you have the link to join, please put it in the chat box. Encourage you all to go there if you have time. Um, again, great meeting you all for the first time that are joining us. Happy Friday to you all. Have a great weekend. Get you some self-care in. Happy Father's Day to the fathers. Happy Juneteenth. Peace and love, y'all. See y'all next week. Peace and love. Talk to y'all soon.